Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you, Jesus, for your love, mercy, and your grace. I thank you, Lord, for the anointing that I feel in this house, for the touch of your Holy Spirit. And God, I pray right now that you would not only anoint my words, but God, that you would tender the heart of your people. Sincerely, Father, I pray today for a spiritual awakening. I pray for a revelation that would go beyond the hearing of our ears, but that would quicken the understanding of our hearts. Let your word, Father, go forth like a sword. Let it go forth like a fire and consume the heart of your people. Father, we repent, God, for our attitudes. We repent for our wickedness and our waywardness. We are asking you, God, today in the name of Jesus that you would move upon our hearts. God will be careful to give you the praise and the glory and the thanks for it in Jesus' name. And everybody says amen and amen. This past week as I was seeking the Lord as to what I would share, I felt like I was caught between two different messages. If you ever understand anything, understand that the enemy hates the word of God. And he wars against the word of God. He wars against the declaring and the proclaiming of the word. He wars against the understanding of the word. He's not only fighting me and what I would preach, but he's fighting you in what you would hear. The devil will wage warfare on many different fronts. If he can get into my mind, then he will wage war against my mind. If he can get into my spirit or into your spirit, he will try to wage war. But how do you know the devil is a liar? And he is already defeated, shall we? I can tell you that in the last several years, it's not been easy. Can anybody give me a witness? And in the, just the last couple of years, it's even changed in my life. But I can tell you I'm coming out on the other side. And I've got a new understanding of his mercy and his grace and his power and his faithfulness. But this past week was one of those times when I just really felt the warfare. And I felt like I had two different messages and I tried to figure it out how that I could bring the two together. I prayed and I struggled and I tried my best to find a way to bring them together for this service today. But do you know this morning that it's not really our responsibility, that's the work of the Holy Ghost. Come on somebody. My responsibility is to walk in obedience and to deliver that which God has set before me and then trust, everybody say trust, the work of the Holy Ghost in this service. Hallelujah. Is anybody hearing that? The work of the Spirit in this service in your heart to make sense out of what sometimes doesn't make sense to me. Come on, somebody. I tried my best to tie them together. Then I decided that I would obey the Lord. And rather than trying to tie them together, I would deliver them briefly as part one and part two. Come on, somebody. And then you can decide, or the work of the Holy Spirit can decide what he's going to do. Part number one, I want you to turn with me to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter number 12. We're going to read one verse, verse number 39. Matthew 12 and 39. And hopefully at the end of the message, you'll realize how the Lord would tie these two together. Matthew chapter number 12, verse number 39. The Bible says, but he answered and said unto them, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. I went to 
that passage of scripture because recently I've been asking the Lord where are or where is the God of Elijah? Where are the great services? The mighty revivals? Where are the blind receiving their sight? The deaf ears popping open during the middle of a worship service? Where are the drug addicts jumping up and running to the altar while we sing songs laying their addiction on the altar? Where is the mighty move of God? Is anybody hearing this? Where is the outpouring of the Spirit? Where are the miracles? And I mean, we have some good services from time to time that we see God move in a special way. But really, where are the miracles, the healings, the deliverances, demons being cast out, the mighty power of the Holy Ghost coming down on a church where we're not even able to stand up and minister to the Lord? I ask God, where are those services? Because I don't know about you, but listen, I want to see God move. I want to see God pour out his spirit. I want to see a revival. I want people in this altar being radically transformed and changed. I want to see God do something great in these last days. And I'm not satisfied. So I'm praying and asking the Lord, and the Lord said to me, I desire to do all of those things. I have promised to do those very things. I have done them in the past. I desire to do them today. Somebody hear that? Do you know God desires to do great and mighty things? In your life, in this church, in your family, in this city, in this nation, and around the world, God desires to do great things. He said, I desire to do the same today, but my people are not ready. They are not prepared. And then he took me to that verse and I read that there's an evil and adulterous generation that seeketh a sign. And he reminded me of that verse. And then he took me to the sixth chapter of Matthew when Jesus previously had given instruction. Matthew 6 and 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. Everybody say that with me. All these things shall be added unto you. So in the sixth chapter, Jesus gives us instruction. Seek the kingdom of God first. And all of these things will be added unto you. But in Matthew chapter number 12, they're seeking a sign instead of seeking the kingdom. And he said, I'm not going to give you a sign, but you need to seek me instead. And the Lord said to me, the church today has gotten the cart before the horse. Is that right? We've gotten the cart before the horse. It's kind of like we want to lose weight, but we don't want to go to the gym. We want to get in shape, but we don't want to change how we eat. I mean, you know, there is a natural order to things, and there is a supernatural order to things. And God said, my people have gotten the cart before the horse. They do not seek me. They seek miracles. They do not know me. They only look for blessings. They do not understand the hour. They live as though things have not changed. Therefore, if I, the Lord, pour out my spirit, what does it really accomplish? He said, I... I 
pour out my spirit. I pour out my spirit. I move to accomplish a purpose. I pour out my spirit to strengthen, to lift up, and yes, to meet the needs of my people. But if I pour out my spirit upon a house that doesn't have a foundation, that house will ultimately fall. And my glory will be squandered. Is anybody hearing this? I asked my youngest son the other day, do you know what it means to squander? He said, to waste. To allow something to go to waste. Now listen, we are living in a time we are a wasteful people. We throw away more food every night in our trash can that could feed many, many people. We are a wasteful generation. And God said, if I pour out my spirit upon a house that doesn't have a foundation, my glory will be squandered, it will be wasted. And God said, I will not cast my pearl before swine. Mm. You know, I got to thinking... What good does it really do to taste the glory of God for a moment if we're only to then shortly return to the pig pen of this world? God could and would send his mighty spirit down into this church today that would go beyond just having a good service, that would go beyond having a few goosebumps, that would go beyond a few people laying around the altar weeping and crying. God could send a mighty wave of the Holy Ghost into this church that would radically change everything we know. Hear me, many would be blessed, many would be made to feel good, some might be delivered and changed but if that's all we do is relish in his glory for a moment or for the duration of a service what has been accomplished I will tell you church there is a God in heaven that desires to do great things in our midst come on somebody but that same God in heaven requires a church that's ready, that is set apart, that is sold out, that is built on the solid foundation of the word, that walks daily in the power of the Holy Ghost, that understands their calling, their purpose, and even the hour that they're now living in. Those are requirements. To seeing and knowing and experiencing the glory of the Most High God. Without those things, we have no solid foundation. Without a solid foundation, we cannot bear the weight of His glory. And without those things, His glory is cast before swine that will walk out of His presence and right back into the pig pen to dirty themselves again. How many times have you been in a service when the glory of God came down and you were touched for a moment, but you were not changed? Let me tell you, there's, listen to me, there has got to be a shift. A shift in our lives, a shift in our spirits, and a shift in the church world. There has got to be a radical change. Turn around and tell somebody things have got to change. A radical change. Anybody hearing this? Are you with me this morning? Shout amen. A radical change. Because listen, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting every time different results. And for too long, we've been coming to church and we've been doing it the same way. We live out there like the devil and we come in here and want to feel the glory. Listen, God is looking for a church that will set themselves apart, that will sell out to God, that will walk in the power of the Holy Ghost, that will walk according to the light of this word and then... His glory can be manifested. 
Man, I tell you, there's got to be a change in the way that we live. In the way that we worship. In the way that we give. In the way that we serve. In the way that we believe. And it's all summed up in the instruction that Jesus gave. Anybody ever had a mama that was always right? Shout amen. Okay, better yet, anybody got a wife that's always right? Shout amen. Come on, somebody. But let me tell you, Jesus, if I say Jesus, he's always right. Is that right? Now, he, he, it might not always make sense to our natural ears. But if Jesus says it, how many of you know you can take it to the bank? If he said it, you can know that he's right. You may not understand it, but if you'll believe it, and if you'll walk in it, and if you'll obey, you know, it'll always come to pass. And you'll look back over your life and you'll say, Jesus was right the entire time. And it's all summed up in that instruction. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all those things will be added unto you. God first. Come on, somebody. I said God first. Knowing him, trusting him, serving him, worshiping him, God first. When God becomes our priority, not the miracles, not the blessings, not the goosebumps, but when God in heaven becomes our priority, when we, like Isaiah, see a vision of him and we cry out, woe is me, I am undone. And listen, when God becomes that number one priority, let me tell you, the Bible says, and he will cause all the goodness and all the glory and all the blessings to follow after us the rest of our lives. When we seek God first, hallelujah. When we seek him, do you know that you cannot seek him and not be changed? Now you can relish in his glory for a moment and remain the same. You can be the benefactor of the blessing and remain the same. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? You can have a moment of conviction and be the same three hours later. You can have even a fleshly desire to feel the touch of God but still remain the same. But when you come into his presence, when you seek his face, when you behold him, when you understand him, when God comes down and convicts your soul, hear me, you cannot find him lest there's a change. Not seeking him for what he can do, but for who he is. Somebody just say, thank you, Lord, for who you are. Properly placing our faith in the finished work of Christ at the cross. Being filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Come on, somebody. Now, do you know we are a Pentecostal church? Well, we call ourselves that, but we don't always act that way. But do you know on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit of God came down out of heaven like the sound of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting, and cloven tongues of fire set upon each of them, and they were baptized in the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave utterance and then they went on to turn the world right side up they went on to cast out demons they went on to heal the sick does anybody hear what i'm saying number one we've got to trust god and be filled with the holy ghost he got that of us Listen, if the preachers of today have failed anywhere, we have failed in preaching the necessity of the Holy Ghost in the life of the believer. Does anybody understand this? Too many people in the church, and to be honest with you entirely, too many people. 
people in this church. We have, there are so many that do not have the baptism. They don't know what it is to walk in the power. They don't manifest the gifts of the Spirit. Listen, there's a God in heaven that's waiting to pour it out. To pour it out upon your life. Being filled. Jesus said, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Hallelujah. Listen, speaking of a constant flow that will come up out of you, not a one-time experience. Well, one time when I was eight years old, no, well, one time when I came to the Lord, I, I spoke him, no, no, God's talking about a work, a manifestation of the Holy Spirit that will be active and current in your life, that there's a river that never does stop flowing. You may be walking down the aisle at Walmart, and all of a sudden you begin to speak in that unknown tongue. You may be dealing with a situation in your family, and it's not your wisdom or knowledge, but it's the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. It's discernment. What are you talking about, preacher? I'm talking about being filled with the Holy Ghost of God and manifesting the nine gifts of the Spirit. Yeah. Knowing the Word better than we know our politicians. Becoming a living sacrifice. The bigger part of the church doesn't show up to service to be a living sacrifice. They come to be blessed and touched. Not remembering that's our reasonable service. Serving with humility and walking in faithfulness. Properly understanding the will of God and the purpose to which we've been born. And then when those things are active in our life, understand we become prime candidates for God to pour out his glory. For God to send a mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But hear me, but the church, the church today, we've gotten so far away from those things. We have become so worldly. Amen. Father, let that conviction settle in. God, not condemnation which comes from the devil, but conviction in the name of Jesus. We have become worldly. We operate in the flesh far more than we do the spirit. We have become selfish and self-righteous. Hallelujah. We want, we want, we want. But we won't give, give, give. We want to see his glory, but we won't give him glory. We want the promises of the word, but we don't really know the word. We want to be used, but we won't pay the price. We want victory, but we're not willing to fight the battle. We want power, but we're not filled with the Spirit. Church, you hear me? Something is wrong. I said something is wrong. You say, what is it? We've been overcome by the Spirit of this age. We've grown distracted, compromised, sensual, earthly, and that driving force that once burned in the heart of the church to just know God has vanished. Paul said in Philippians 3 and 10, he said, and I believe this is the cry of his heart. This is why Paul was able to, to make the missionary journey. It's why he was able to endure the times of hardship. It's why he was sold out to God. He said in 3 and 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. That I might know him. By far. 
no longer the cry of today's church. Our cry has become that we might be blessed, that we might be satisfied, that we might be happy. We've become an evil and adulterous generation that seeks after a sign rather than seeking after the Lord. Has anybody hear what I'm saying? You can go home and you can call your neighbor and say, well, the preacher was a little too hard today. But I will tell you this morning, this is the truth concerning the church from the spirit of the living God. We have become an evil and adulterous generation long ago. Did the, did the days in the church pass when we had men and women weeping between the porch and the altar? Long ago did those days begin to pass on when we had a church that existed that would shine the glorious light of the gospel into the darkness of this world. This is the reason our world and our families and our lives are in such disarray. There's got to be a change. Do you know why? Because time is short. The end is near. Come on. And we are sadly not ready. There's a verse in Jeremiah that I've always thought to be very frightening. Jeremiah 8 and 20. The harvest is past. The summer has come to an end. And we are not saved. Does anybody hear this? What a tragedy to think that we would make it this far and then fall short. That we would somehow fall short. That we would fall short in our duty to the Lord and to the world around us. Yet it's exactly what's happening today. And it will be our final end if we're not careful. And because, because of our attitude towards the Lord, we have made an error in that we've sought after a sign and we forgot about the author and the giver of life. Somebody hears this. And because of this tragedy, somebody say tragedy. Better yet say it's a tragedy. You see what's going on in our world? Do you see what's going on in your family? What's happening in our nation? In the streets of Springfield, Missouri, it's a tragedy. I'm sorry that I cannot get up here and preach a good, feel-good sermon every Sunday and pat you on the bottom and part your whiskers and put the bottle in. I'm sorry, but I've got to tell the truth. The church has fallen short of the mark in these last days. And while we've been busy asking God to give us a blessing, the world around us is dying and going to hell. And with that being the case, it brings me to part number two. And it is, listen, just how little we realize the hour in which we're living. What's happening, what's coming, and the consequences of it all. Is anybody hearing this? It's as though we don't even see it. Years ago when Tyler was, I don't know, three or four, Michelle and I, we took David and Tyler to Disney World. And I remember we walked through the parks, we rode the rides, we saw the shows, 
Michelle, listen, she drug us around like you wouldn't believe. Am I telling the truth, David? Like at 5.30 a.m., wake up. Non-stop all day long. Myself and the boys, we barely made it through. Come on, somebody. But we're in Disney, and it's hotter than fire. She's dragging us around from park to park. And one day, we walk up to this theater, and literally, almost against our will, the characters ushered us in to that theater. They were, like, pushing us to go in. And as we walked through the door, they handed us some glasses, some goofy looking glasses. And they sat us down, the, the entire crowd, and there was this big screen in front of us. They gave those glasses out at the front door. And I watched as everybody started to put those glasses on, but I refused. That was back when I used to care what people thought. I didn't want to look like an idiot. Come on, somebody. Some of y'all care and you still look like an idiot. Amen. But you know, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't want to look like an idiot, so I said, I'm not putting those dumb things on. Come on, somebody. And I'm looking at the screen, everybody else, they're putting on the glasses, and the screen was big and it was blurry. And I wasn't going to put those glasses on, but everybody else did. And then suddenly, people started reacting. <laughs> then they'd, they'd reach out and go. And they'd duck like that again. And then the kids would scream. And I was like, what in the world is going on? Are they possessed with devils? Because I'm looking at the screen and there's nothing there but a blur. And then finally I decided I'm going to put the glasses on. Somebody say amen. amen. And I put those glasses on and I realized that without those glasses, I would never see what they were seeing. I had to have the right glasses on to enjoy the show like everybody else. And when I put them on, a hand would reach out of the screen. It was like, oh my goodness, you could touch the hand and things would come flying by. And you felt like you had to move. What was it? It was 3D. Yes, come on. Right? I'd never seen 3D. And I think back to that moment when I refused to put the glasses on. And I think to where we are in the present hour. And it's like we've been ushered in to a theater. A few years ago, we were casually walking around the park. Living life, having a good time, enjoying some good services, making some money, making for anybody remember those days, shout amen. But like even almost against our will, we were ushered in to a theater. A few years ago, things started changing. There was a shift in the natural and there was a supernatural shift as well. Honestly, things a few years ago started to get weird. It wasn't by our choice. We were thrust, thrown. Everybody listening and say amen. We were thrown into that theater with no choice at all. A few elections, a few tragic events, an outbreak of an unknown virus. Some really crazy reactions, some bad policy, and we were ushered in to what I would call the end time theater with a preview of coming attractions. And right in front of us all, staring us in the face with an overwhelming power and presence is a gigantic screen that to many is blank and blurry and mysterious. And the reason, the reason we're not seeing things through the proper lens. Amen. I want you to know this morning, things are happening all around us. That carry with them, listen, this is important. Things are happening that carry very severe implications. 
Not only to our current situation, not only to your bank account now, not only to what's happening in this society, but they carry implications that will reach into the lives of our children, our grandchildren, far into the future and even eternity. The problem today is the church largely cannot see what's right in front of their faces. For example, all the conflict that's brewing in the streets, all the economic disasters, the wars that are raging, the international conflicts, the sudden move to embrace climate change, the assault on gender, sexuality, and the basis of truth. From the COVID virus to the many strange things happening around the world today, let me tell you, they are not by accident. They're not just a few bad policies, and they're not just a passing trend. You say, what is it? The Antichrist rule is being set in order, and right now, pieces are being moved into place. Yet so many in the church, we've been caught staring blankly at a screen with no understanding. No understanding of what's happening, of what's coming, or even of what we're supposed to do. Can y'all hear me? And the evidence is our lack, the evidence of our lack of understanding is obvious. If we really could see what's happening, if we could really discern what's coming, if we really knew how short the time really is and how serious the ramifications really are, hear me, things would be much different in the body of Christ. Our altars would be full. We'd be doing everything we could do to get our families in the ark of safety. The way we lived and the way we talk and the way we act would change if we only knew the seriousness of this hour. Amen. Go to Daniel chapter number five. Which I believe perfectly illustrates this point. Daniel chapter number five, verse number one. Everybody with me, say amen. amen. Belshazzar the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes, his wives, and his concubines might drink therein. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem, and the king and his princes and wives and concubines drank in them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver, of brass, of iron, of wood, and of stone. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand. And now notice, I'm sorry, in the first few verses, there were vessels that had been sanctified to remain in God's house. But they were taken out of God's house. And they were perverted in the use of the king's hand. Anybody hearing that? And the Bible said in that same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance was changed and his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his loins were loosed and his knees smote one against the other. Can you imagine the scene? They're having themselves a time. They're worshiping the gods of this world. They're dishonoring the vessels that should have remained in the house of God. And suddenly, on the wall, like on a big screen TV, 
a man's hand appears and begins to write a message. Church, can I tell you this morning, I believe the writing is on the wall. All that's happening right now, all the pieces are being put into place. Things are wrapping up. The end is near. Listen to me again. The writing is on the wall. And since so often the church, like myself in that theater, we have no idea what's going on. We do not understand. Please stay with me. We don't understand the weight of this hour. That's why we so flippantly serve God. It's why we're so wishy-washy in our prayer life. It's why we don't crave or consume the word. It's why there's no real, real driving force in us to be filled with the Holy Ghost because we don't understand the weight of this hour. We don't understand what's happening, what's coming, or what it all means. After seeing the handwriting on the wall and being moved to great fear, listen, the king cried out. Let me say to you this morning, there is a world that is crying out for salvation, for hope, and it only comes in Jesus. So he sees the handwriting and being moved to great fear. The Bible says in verse number seven, listen, the king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans and the soothsayers. And the king spake and said to the wise men of Babylon, whosoever shall read this writing and show me the interpretation thereof shall be clothed with, a, with scarlet and have a chain of gold about his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then came in all the king's wise men, but they could not read the writing, nor make known to the king the interpretation thereof. Then was King Belshazzar greatly troubled, and his countenance was changed in him, and his lords were astonished. Can I say to you this morning, the church today has become much like the wise men, the astrologers, the soothsayers, the well-educated religious people that we just read about. Man, it, don't get quiet. Am I going too long? Is that what it is? Uh, do you have dinner? Are, are you, is your stomach growling? But we've become like those men that the king sent for, but they couldn't understand the writing on the wall. They could see it, but they had no idea what it meant. Just like so many in the church have no idea what everything that's happening is actually meaning. There's no spiritual discernment, no spiritual eyes, no spiritual understanding. Because again, if we did, if we understood, things would be different. Now, if we could see what it all means if we understood what was happening, what was really coming. Like I said a moment ago, don't you agree? And if you do, you can say amen. I just was testing you. Things in the church and in our lives would be dramatically different. But we're still upset because somebody didn't look at us right. We're still upset because things didn't go my way. Anybody hear this? What's going on? We've become like the wise men in Daniel 5 who knew everything but understood nothing. And there's people in this church, you've grown up in church, you can quote the word, you've sat through Sunday school, you've had to endure messages from me for years, you know it, but you don't understand it. You're not seeing through the proper lens. You have no discernment of the hour that we're living in right now because if we did, it would change. There is a monumental shift taking place in the spirit realm that's going to determine the course of eternity for you, your family, the church, and the world. Amen. But sadly, we can't even see it because we're looking through the wrong lens. Hallelujah. We're looking through the lens of the flesh. We're trying to interpret what's written on the wall through the eyes of religion. 
through the eyes of this world, through selfish, sinful, and fearful eyes, and we don't even know that judgment is coming to this world. But thank God when the king realized that none of his wise religious men could interpret the writing on the wall, the Bible said there was another man. Verse number 10, now the queen, by reason of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banquet house. She spake and said, O king, live forever. Let not thy thoughts trouble thee, nor let thy countenance be changed. Listen, there is a man. There is a man in thine kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And in the days of thy father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods was found in him. Whom the king Nebuchadnezzar thy father, I say thy father, made a master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. For as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding, interpreting of dreams and showing of hard sentences and dissolving of doubts were found in the same Daniel. Everybody shout Daniel. Daniel. I love when she makes that first statement, there is a man in whom the spirit of God dwells. He's got wisdom, understanding, an excellent spirit and knowledge. And this man can interpret the writing on the wall. Let me ask you this morning, are you that man? Are you that woman? Are we that church? Does the spirit of the most high God dwell inside of you? Or are you like the religious educated men that didn't know what the writing meant? Has the Spirit of God given you wisdom, knowledge, and discernment? Do you have an excellent spirit? Or have we become like those wise men? You see, in, in an hour when the handwriting was on the wall, the king and the kingdom, they didn't need a bunch of religious people that went through the motions on Sunday morning. They needed a man of God who could discern what was happening and what was coming. Church, if we have a fault in this dark hour, listen, this is one of the greatest faults we have. Is that we don't really know what's happening, what's coming, therefore we don't know what to do. Of course, there's many in the church with a head knowledge of things in their head. They know something's wrong in their head. They know the end is near. There's work to be done, but head knowledge is far from heart knowledge. The wise men knew something wasn't right, but it took Daniel to truly understand. A head knowledge that, is, that, 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 that knows something is wrong will never move us to action, but a heart knowledge will change the way we live. And I will say this, I'm trying to wrap it up. Somebody say, praise the Lord. There are entirely too many people in the church, preachers in the pulpit, who are sitting in the front of that giant big screen television who can't see what's actually happening because they're looking through the wrong lens. There's got to be a Daniel. I said, there's got to be a Daniel. There's got to be a mama, a daddy, a teenager, a husband, a wife, a preacher of the gospel that will return to the word of God and the spirit of God. We can never, never truly discern the hour unless we're looking through the lens of this holy word. Come on, somebody. We can never truly discern the hour that we're living in, the importance, the ramifications, the implications. We can never truly understand it lest we've got the work of the Holy Spirit because he is the one that will lead us and guide us into all truth. Amen. There's got to be a change. When we go to this word and when we're filled with the spirit, we'll see clearly through a supernatural lens that will, mm, that will re reveal the truth that is set before us, that our world is dying. Jesus is coming. 
We better be ready not only to go, but to work until it comes. If we will see through the proper lens, let me tell you, I won't have to preach a sermon on how to treat one another. That's good preaching. I won't have to preach a sermon on how the, to beg people to worship. I won't even have to preach a series on why we should give tithe and offering. I won't have to beg people to pray in the altar before the service. If we could just see through the proper lens. But if not, and if you would come. If not, do, do you see why this morning I prayed that the Holy Spirit would tender the heart of the people? Because it's got to be him that touches your heart today. If we leave this building and we refuse to let the work of the Holy Spirit be accomplished in us, then we can join the ranks of the wise men that knew everything but understood nothing. Whether all of this makes sense in the natural, I don't know. But I know the Spirit of God is desperately trying to get our attention. He's trying to get our attention. Handwriting is on the wall. Are we going to understand it? Are we going to hear the word? Are we going to make a change? Stand with me. Heavenly Father, I worship you. And I give you glory. Father, I have done my very best to preach exactly what you gave me and nothing else. So, Father, I pray that the Spirit of God would ride upon my words. And, God, I pray today that it would pass through the ear gate. He got that of us that God, those words would find lodging in the spirit of your people. And I pray today, God, that there would be a change in us. A change in our hearts. A change in our church. Father, I give you praise. I have obeyed you and now I leave the results. I leave them up to you in Jesus' name. I invite this entire church, not asking for you to raise your hands, but I'm asking you if you would to come and find a place to pray. Whether you need to lay on your face, kneel at the altar, walk around, whether you need to kneel at your chair, but I am asking you today. I'm leaving the results up to the Lord. Now it's it's been delivered. It's off my chest. It's up to you now to decide what you're going to do with the word of the Lord. Because I will tell you, this wasn't John English's word. This is the word of God. Come, find a place. Kneel and pray. You say, well, what do we pray about? That's between you and the Lord. But I believe there needs to be a change. A radical change in Jesus' name.